much for coming out um, into this beautiful room. People ask me all the time where I like to be transported back into the time I study. And the answer um, as, as female body is generally no. Um, but if it could be in spaces like this, um, maybe sometimes for a little time. So um, I was thinking it's a relief to step out of the maelstrom of American politics right now and talk about art. Um, although, to talk about Copley's world is also to talk about trying to find stability in a narrow little slice of ground, middle ground, as extremes are falling away on both sides. Um, so maybe it's not such a relief after all. And I'll start with somebody very familiar uh, to all of you, I think, Copley's iconic work, uh, the picture of Paul Revere, he painted in 17. 68, uh, the summer that Paul Revere made the Liberty Bowl, um, arguably the second most famous face in revolutionary America, George Washington, is the first. And I think um, stands in New England uh, for a kind of plain Yankee value, New England nationalism, in the way that uh, Washington embodies a sort of Southern planter. So Revere, of course, in his shirt sleeves, he's looking right at you, he doesn't look any man in the eye, he is who he is, and he wears what he wears. And we make much of this um, in our museums. This is the way that it hung in the MFA in 1951, about 20 years after it came from Revere's family hands into the museum. Um, you can see that that's an altar with the Liberty Bowl in front of it, sort of chalice-like, and the flags of the Commonwealth and the United States uh, on either side. And here's the fabulous <coughs> new Part of the America's Wings presentation today, which is, of course, a much more updated kind of museology. And yet it's still an altar um, in a gallery called Revolutionary America, a gallery that's dominated by Copley's. The MFA is, is the largest collection of Copley's art, the most significant collection of Copley's art in the world, with over 80 works. And there are along the side, along the left side there, these four canvases matched in size of Sam Adams, John Hancock, Dr. Joseph Warren, and Mercy Otis Warren, um, who stand as sort of patriot super friends there, um, as if they were somehow plotting when Copley painted them between 1763 and about 1770 um, to be on the front lines of a battle for a country that they had never heard of um, some years down the road, or as if, if, you, if I had a close-up of Hancock um, perched over his ledger, as if he was practicing for the Declaration of Independence. Um, I bring this up because I think we tend to tell the story of the revolution through the eyes of men like Paul Revere as if they were urgently facing forward to a future that only they could see um, for quite some time and as if the road toward that future were straight and obvious and wide, uh, you know, pebble strewn and risky uh, but, but, uh, but clear. Um, and men like Copley, um, men of profound ambivalence, um, and unease and uh, deliberateness, which is exactly what made him so acute as a painter, right? Watchful men, um, uh, fade into the background. Um, so the gamut of my book and of my talk tonight is to ask not only what Copley's world was like, but what the world of revolutionary America looks like if we see it through his eyes. And I want to start with something that should be very familiar to people who live in the town of Newport, Rhode Island, which is that when we think about Copley's world, we're thinking about a world that is oceanic, um, that is uh, connected by the highways of the age of sail, which are the seas and not the roads. Um, this is a map of Copley's Boston. It's the Bonner map, first printed in 1722 and reissued continuously through the 18th century. This is an edition close to the uh, close to the revolution. I don't know if I can get I can't get laser to point at this, but you can see the Long Wharf jutting out into Boston Harbor. It gets out about half a mile, uh, sort of urgently uh, reaching east. Um, as in Newport, east is what the map is keyed off of. In fact, in the legend on the map, it's east, not north, that is the orientating uh, factor of the map. Um, the ships everywhere are a common way of representing 
uh, places like what the Boston Copley was born to in 1738 was, which was a second tier British seaport. Um, not, a, uh, not a future American capital, but a second tier British seaport. Um, Copley was the child of immigrants, uh, which was not an unusual thing to be in the 18th century. It's a world where people are crisscrossing all over, but it's, um, but it's a relatively unusual thing to be in Boston, where about 80% of people of European descent are uh, the descendants of um, people who are already there. So that's uh, quite singular. He's born during the second major wave of Irish immigration to Boston, several hundred people into a town of about 15,000. Um, so his parents have made an ocean voyage uh, already, and the circuits of trade that connect that world um, put Boston closer to Newport, where there are important trading relationships, especially to Kingston in Jamaica, and Bridgetown in Barbados, um, to Halifax, and the sort of northern fishery circuit, and closest of all, if we're thinking in terms of cultural and economic relationships, social relationships, to London. Um, so that when we're thinking of his Boston, don't think that it's on the Sella Corridor that uh, connects to New York and Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. Those places have very little to do with the Boston of his youth. Um, some of Copley's first, first pictures are seascapes, um, uh, sort of juvenile copy from European prints. Um, this is a uh, 1754 painting called The Return of Neptune, which is at the Met and uh, painted about the same year. Um, this is Galatea riding the waves, which is held by the, uh, held by the MFA. Um, so pieces of juvenilia like this are rarely displayed. I don't know that the MFA has ever displayed Galatea. It's a, it's a halting kind of paint by numbers production, which is exactly what he's doing, right? He's got, uh, he's got a, a European print um, based on some painting that he cannot possibly see. He's got uh, some oils and, uh, and pigments. Um, he's got the world around him, and he is trying to paint himself into this uh, imperial tradition, oceanic tradition, um, with, in this case, an image that is also uh, evokes a Handel opera, Aces, uh, Handel oratorio, Aces of Galatea. It's one of the most popular pieces of secular English music in the 18th century. So he envisions himself from very early on, this is a 16-year-old, um, as a kind of cosmopolitan. Um, and when I look at things like this, I see at once how urgently connected Boston wants to be to that world of uh, English culture, and also how far away it is. Um, that uh, to imagine a world in color, um, you have to really stretch yourself on this remote side of the ocean. It seems um, somewhat paradoxical in the genre of biography to talk about the role of accident and happenstance. I think biography is a genre where individuals make choices and the choices make a world. Um, and Copley uh, was somebody who um, was very reluctant to embrace a chosen future uh, in anything but his art. And we can talk about that paradox later. He was very purposeful in his uh, artistic and, uh, and trading ambition, and uh, a man adrift in terms of how he saw himself in a larger geopolitical order. So I wanted to put up this quotation from a Loyalist pamphlet in 1782. This is the, the first two sentences of this pamphlet that evokes this worldview um, that, uh, that history happens to you rather than you make it. Choice and plan, it seem, have seldom much influence in determining either men's characters or their conditions. These are usually the result of circumstances utterly without our control. I think Copley would have tattooed this on his form. It's, uh, it is um, enough uh, that speaks to his character. Um, so I wanna, I'll come back to this quotation again when we talk about the macro, um, but talking first about the micro, I wanna talk about some of the happenstances that shaped uh, who this talented young person born in 1738 became. Uh, so one thing that I think is important to uh, the eye and the mind and influence that he developed uh, is that he was that rarest of things in colonial New England. He was the only child. Um, this is 
almost inconceivable in his world. It's much more typical to have a married couple be quote unquote barren and produce no children than it is to have one. Uh, his father died soon after he was born. The last year that we know his father was alive was when Copley called Jack was three. Um, and his mother did not produce another child for 10 years um, when she remarried and he was 10. Um, so for a long time in that rough plebeian world of the Long Wharf that I showed you, probably uh, this, the first home we can place him in is along the northern edge of the Long Wharf, one of those little ramshackle attached wooden, barely more than shacks. Uh, it's just him and his mother um, who takes over some part of his father's tobacco trade. Uh, father seems to have been some kind of wholesaler, um, tobacco merchant, and she's a tobacco retailer selling tobacco on the Long Wharf. Um, the fact that he has no male kin to look out for him in that rough plebeian world, I think it's one of the things that, um, that gives him a keen eye, very frankly. It makes him a sort of watchful, uh, protective sort. We see it in his letters as soon as he begins to write. Um, this is an image produced, you recognize this fellow? It's Cotton Mather. Um, what does Cotton Mather have to do with Copley? Cotton Mather? Cotton Mather was born, died uh, nine years before Copley was born. Um, uh, and when Copley was 10, his mother remarried, another happenstance, um, and she remarried a, an engraver and portraitist from London named Peter Pelham, uh, a metropolitan, um, also an immigrant like her, also with ties to Boston's uh, new Irish community. Um, Pelham made his Boston reputation by engraving this portrait of Mather in Mezzotin. He had the very good fortune to have had Mather sat to him just weeks before Mather uh, elevated the value of his stock by dying. Um, <laughs> so uh, hawking this Mezzotin about was um, Copley's stepfather's debut on the stage. Mezzotint itself is a new enough medium at the time that he has to explain in the newspapers what it even is. Um, so Copley gets a stepfather when he's 10 and he gets somebody who has a particular set of skills and tools, um, a trade to pass along, which his father really had not. And between the ages of 10 and 13, um, it seems very likely, though it's undocumented, that Copley worked in some kind of informal apprenticeship with a man um, who drew this portrait. Um, Copley also gained in that uh, brief three-year period uh, the little brother, Henry Pelham, called Harry, uh, half-brother who would become uh, the most important kinsman in his life, save one. And then the final happenstance, uh, when Copley was 13, um, this brief period of opening ended because his stepfather died. So an intact family with a male provider and a little brother, uh, also a, a female infant that died almost immediately, is resolved um, after just about two and a half years, Peter Pelham dies. Um, so a kind of urgency to put those skills uh, that he must have been uh, working in apprenticeship to use. There are geopolitical accidents as well as personal ones that shape all of our lives. Um, and it's important from the time he is born uh, until the day he dies, Copley lives predominantly in a world of war. And I put these up here just to give you a sense of the density of European conflict playing out in the North American theater uh, for the early half of his life and then European war uh, for the back half of his life. So unbeknownst to John Singleton Copley, he's born in the last year of the longest peace for a century. Um, so from the time he is one, uh, the American colonies, Britain's American colonies, those 26, not 13, American colonies are embroiled first in three, uh, actually, you could say that they are all four European wars that have American theaters because the War of 1812, of course, is the American theater of the Napoleonic Wars. So um, this is 45 of the 77 years that he lived. Uh, are lived during wartime. Um, and this is an enormously shaping thing about how one makes one's way in this world. And for the second of those wars, uh, the war to uh, the war that made America, the Seven Years' War, so-called, though it lasts nine years, um, also known as the Fourth French and Indian War, which is how Copley would probably have known it. Um, it's a tremendous advantage to him. 
that the moment that he is coming into adulthood in a trade uh, is a moment um, that Boston is a hub in war. Uh, because people like uh, Major George Scott, who's shown here, are coming through town, um, are giving out contracts to other merchants, uh, are mustering soldiers, and are trying to use the war to grab the next rung in the imperial ladder. So the first big commissions that Copley gets in his life um, are these seven years war products. They're not paintings that we pay a lot of attention to because they're quite formulaic military paintings, one red coat after another. Um, they're actually sort of distinctive things in this one where um, Scott has modified his field dress and leather helmet for the, uh, for the conditions of frontier warfare. He's clearly very proud at showing that. Um, but mostly there's not a lot in terms of artistic grammar to say about these, except that people who want themselves wrapped in red in the fabric of the empire and then painted wrapped in red so that they can give those paintings to a superior officer as a gift, say. Um, or uh, in Scott's case, there are ties between Scott and Thomas Hancock, John Hancock's uncle. Uh, John Hancock, his uncle, is a big provisioner for the war. Um, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a moment where the presence of imperial placement in America is a really welcome thing. Um, one of the things that becomes so uh, sticky at the time of the revolution is very much welcome. Um, in, you know, people in Boston, not just Copley, but people in Boston in general, they loved the sight of a red coat until they hated it. So if you're looking at 1755, uh, it's inconceivable that they'd be calling them uh, damned lobster scoundrels and blade racks um, 15 years later. So I would submit a counterfactual that without the Seven Years' War to crack open his artistic practice and, uh, and his world, I don't know whether Copley would have begun by the end of that war to dream of sending his work uh, to London, which he and other Bostonians called home, to send his work home. Um, this is a uh, boy with a flying squirrel, which he sent to London in 1765, worked on for much of 1764, sends it home for the particular pe uh, purpose of being hung at a public exhibition. The public exhibition culture in London is then new and itself rises out of the martial spirit of the Seven Years' War. King George III comes in and says, we want to unite art and arms in a way that we're going to spread imperial glory uh, around the world. The network of sea captains and merchants and contacts in London that make it possible to get this painting from the docks on Long Wharf um, over to the Haymarket is also built up through the Seven Years' War. Um, so uh, I would call this a Seven Years' War painting in that, um, in that way. Um, by the time Copley sends the Times Journal to London, uh, the Stamp Act has, uh, has met with its protest in Boston and in Newport. This is your own Martin Howard, um, as Ingrid called out earlier. Um, uh, Copley writes about him in the letter that encloses Boy with the Flying Squirrel and says, you know, the Stamp Act has occasioned an awful lot of noise and confusion. Um, good men have had to fly aboard the king's ships for their own safety, and Howard is one of those whom he, whom he, uh, whom he calls out in that way. Um, I sh I'm showing this picture not only because it's old home week for it down here, um, but for another reason. So Howard, of course, comes back. This is painted around 1770 when Howard comes to take up an imperial judgeship in North Carolina. Uh, this is also the red, the red cloth of empire. Um, uh, you know, doubt lightly a more vermilion shade in its original uh, painting. So if we if we tend to tell the story from the Boston perspective of there's the Stamp Act and then there's the massacre and before you know it it's the Tea Party and then Hancock's signature is um, put to its ultimate destiny on the Declaration of Independence. Here's the Loyalist who frees and comes back to a higher place in a uh, in a raw colony. So in the fall of 1769, after the Stamp Act riots, uh, after um, the uh, resistance that's produced the Liberty Bowl and the summer that Paul painted, uh, that 
Papa painted Paul Revere. Um, Papa makes the most important decision of his life when he marries Susanna Farnham Clark in uh, November of 1769. Um, his marriage was long delayed. He wrote about this in his, uh, in his letters, that it took a kind of fortitude and uh, uh, diligence, a word he uses a lot, um, to forestall marriage until he had gotten his career on a stable bottom. Um, he was 31 by the time he married. Uh, this was about six years on average after men usually married in his day, so he knew that he was um, waiting tactically, and I think he also married um, both for love and money, which of course uh, are not nearly as opposed then or now um, as, we, uh, as we like to mythologize. Uh, the marriage was an enormous success on, on just about every count. It quickly produced several children. Uh, Betsy is born nine months and not one day sooner after, uh, after the wedding. Um, uh, it's a marriage filled with great affection if their letters are to be uh, taken seriously, which I think they should be. Um, it's an enormously successful family. Uh, she also brings a huge portion uh, of land and money to the family. Um, this is a watercolor that's done in 1768 to show John Hancock's house, which is over here. Um, those three little houses are part of the Copley Estate back of Beacon Street, and he owns, by the time he's done assembling this property, about 20 acres of Beacon Hill. It's the largest contiguous land holding in Boston, um, and that comes from her dowry. So before, uh, before that, he says, he tells us in his letters, he's making about 300 pounds a year, which puts him in uh, a parallel with a sort of middle lawyer after they're married. Um, he ascends to the kind of company uh, that was like the people he painted. Um, and becoming a landed gentleman, putting together this farm that he calls Mount Pleasant, is one of those uh, ways of marking that achievement. Copley also becomes a slaveholder, at least upon his marriage. It's possible that he owned slaves before he was married, um, but uh, it's on his marriage that I can see it first in his letters. Um, this is, as far as I know, never been discussed in scholarship about him, though the letters in which he refers to his slaves have been published for a hundred years. It's, uh, you know, it's so only so recently a part of the way we see 18th century New England that it's one of those facts of life that has hidden literally in plain sight. Um, so Copley both practiced and theorized slavery in his work. Um, this is, of course, uh, a study for the figure at the top of Watson and the Shark, who has some relationship to Copley's family. It's a very intimate portrait um, showing teeth, which is a sign of both condescension and closeness, um, just creeping into the vocabulary of the arts in the 18th century. I don't know who he is. Um, he's called in the catalog of Copley's son's estate, uh, and it's the son who husbands all the pictures for many years, um, a quote-unquote favorite Negro, which could mean that he is a member of the household in some way, a servant, uh, an ex-slave, unlikely to be still enslaved in London when this was painted. Uh, but the people in his, uh, among his bound staff in Boston were a boy called Snap, who was probably from the Caribbean, uh, a girl called Lucy, whom Copley sold into the family of Isaac Royal of Medford, um, and a boy or man called Cato, who we know about because he married soon after uh, Copley left the American colonies. So he gets land and children and love. Uh, he becomes a slaveholder, which is a sign of his growing wealth. And he also inherits, through his kinship to Sufi Clark and her father-in-law, a very particular relationship to an extremely vexed commodity in tea. Um, so Suki's father made himself wealthy as a kind of opportunity, uh, opportunistic merchant in the Indies trade, both east and west, uh, selling sugar and rum, sometimes slaves, um, selling indigo and rice, uh, some Carolina trade in there, and uh, on occasion, off and on again, selling tea in the 1770s. He gets out of it, he, there are letters saying, I decided to burn all my tea casks, enough with this tea stuff. Um, and then when the Tea Act is passed, and there's this clear channel 
for East India Company tea to come into the American market um, at a rate that's not much more expensive than the smuggled Dutch tea that most Americans drink. Richard Clark thinks that's a pretty good deal. Um, and uh, there's an opportunity to go to London and petition the East India Company for the exclusive licenses that will allow American merchants to consign East India tea uh, in the colonies. And he sends his son, and his son has the great, seemingly good fortune to be one of the three firms in Boston who gets a license. And so um, you, unlike Copley, know what happened next, uh, you know, all of the celebration of getting this license in July of 1773 has come a cropper by November of that year as the tea ships are steaming toward the harbor and mobs are attacking the Clark House uh, and driving them into exile. They're in exile on the castle, the fortress in the middle of Boston Harbor, well before the tea party on December 16th, and after the tea is dumped. Uh, the plurality of which is Copley's father in laws T. Um, Copley has unwittingly joined the political party. They are persona non grata. And I want here to quote John Adams, um, part of a quotation that we all know well from his diary. It's in many, many American history textbooks, including mine and People in a Nation. This is the most magnificent moment of all. This is the morning after the Tea Party. There is a dignity, a majesty, a sublimity in this last effort of the patriots that I greatly admire. The destruction of the tea is so bold, so daring, so firm and intrepid and inflexible. It must have so important consequences that I can't but consider it as an epoca in history. We very rarely quote the next sentence in which Adam says, trying to get the touch pad to work here, many persons wish that as many dead carcasses were floating in the harbor as there are chests of tea. And he goes on to list the, way the, the people he would see face down, the people so hardened and abandoned um, that they had proved implacable in the face of Boston's distress and who deserved whatever was coming to them. One of them was Copley's father in law. Uh, so that uh, from December of 1773, uh, into the next spring, um, that middle ground in which Copley is trying to live uh, in a stable and balanced way, um, it's really gone. And the people who consider themselves as he would have uh, for the first half of his life, British Americans hyphenated, um, were first forced to uh, pick a side of the hyphen, the thing that he least wanted to do. So I'll come back. Uh, to James Moody, that wanting to hang on to a sense of making no choice in a world that demanded choices. And this is a way, um, actually, to think about all loyalists as the people who just want to remain what they were, uh, you know, who, who are more allegiant to the concepts and the world of their birth than to trying on some newfangled thing. Loyalism isn't a choice in the way that embracing um, the Patriot Road is. And Copley always insisted, in fact, that he didn't make a choice. That he was, as he put it um, in one of the many letters he later wrote, trying to reclaim his Pekin Hill property. Um, sorry, the touch pad is You're too technologically sophisticated for yourself. <laughs> um, I'm going to paraphrase rather than quote because the quote has fallen away from me. Um, he says that he was drawn home to pursue art in a way that he could not have done in America a year before the war with no idea of what was coming. Um, this is half true. We'll just leave it there. This is half true. He could not have pursued art in America. Uh, any further than he had already done. In fact, one of the miracles of his 38 years in British America is that he can paint from a very early age, I think from the time of that red coat, um, better than anything he has ever seen. Right? How do you, how do you outstrip everything you can see? 
and he has done it. And if you doubt my word, look at the feet outside. Um, you know, he, he has a world to aspire to by European and other itinerants um, who have their work hanging in Boston, and he's better than all of them almost as soon as he breaks, takes, takes out a brush. But he can't see Raphael. Um, this is his uh, ascension painted in Rome in 1775 in homage to Raphael's Transfiguration, also in competition with Raphael's Transfiguration. Uh, and he writes in the letters where he's describing this world bursting into color, um, what it's like to suddenly be seeing. I shall have nothing to do but see, he says. Uh, and he does things like write home to his brother Harry and say, I want to try to describe Titian's flesh tones to you. So go to Hancock's house. Um, see if he'll let you take the pan and syrinx outside. Look inside of Pan's thigh. Um, there's a little bit of flesh that's almost like that, but it's not really because this is much more luminescent. That's a copy and it's really crap at the end of the day, but, but try. I mean, it's like trying to describe color to a blind person. And so when he says he's pulled out to see art, that's not true. Uh, that's not false. When he says that he didn't anticipate that things would get worse, uh, that there would be choices to make, um, that strikes me as somewhat wishful thinking. Uh, he wrote a lot in the year uh, that he was traveling the continent while his wife, who was pregnant, and three children, and his uh, vulnerable and hot-headed younger brother, and his persona non grata uh, in-laws, um, and his aging and infirm mother all stayed in Boston where things were going from bad to worse. And um, historians love it when people are fall far apart, right? When things, when things go wrong for people in their personal lives in a way that generates evidence. Um, it's just a joy for me to have them on other sides of the ocean. And of course, other sides of the ocean are not other, only other sides of space, but they're other sides of time. Um, so uh, Copley is in hot heaven. He is uh, listening to opera and eating French food. He writes home to his mother and says they use a new dish for every course. They, they have napkins. <laughs> they, you know, you just, you just, and it's, and it's cheap. You just wouldn't, you think they're filthy, but they're not. It's, uh, it's so civilized. It's more civilized than the most elegant people we know. Um, and so, if you think about uh, a letter like this written in March of 1775, so he's responding to news that Harry wrote him in January, which he's just learned, and Harry will read this letter in May. That's the, the sort of split screen effect of being on the other side of the world. And you can hear the sort of happy sadness of it, right? Um, imagine being Harry getting this letter in May. We know what happens in April of 1775. From your brother saying, could anything be more fortunate than the time of my leaving Boston? So sorry about America. Um, it's July when he learns that war broke out in April. Um, and importantly, he calls it, as many people do at the time, a civil war. I think the revolution as civil war has fallen out of our national mythology because we need the United States to be born in glory out of ideas um, rather than in struggle and out of blood. I think that our present day politics might actually be more peaceful if we acknowledge that we had a violent birth. Um, it's very obvious to Copley that this is a civil war. Uh, he thinks that it will rage equivalent with any other civil war at any time. He, he reads uh, you know, theories of civil war going back into early modern Europe. He believes two things about this war uh, that caused him to tell his stepbrother, whoever comes to you and tells you to put on their uniform, do not do it. Um, one is he thinks the Americans will win. He's got to be one of the only people anywhere in the conflict in July of 1775 who believes the Americans will win. And this is because he's painted all these people. He knows that they will not back down uh, to the last inch. Um, and then he also believes that the chaos will only have begun with the American victory. Uh, so he writes and tells his brother whether this will be the greatest republic or the greatest despotism of the world the world has ever known. Uh, you know, you may not be alive to find out. Don't pick up a gun. I'm not sure we still find out. And then at the same moment of 
pain and anxiety, tremendous anxiety for them stuck in besieged Boston, an infant stuck in besieged Boston. Um, again, the relief. I would have found it very difficult to have left if I stayed any longer. Thank God I got out of Dodge. Um, but if I had left any sooner, it would have been harder to persuade my family to come home. And now there is no choice yet left. So that the exhilaration of having choice taken away from you, of not being made to make a choice, I think the way Copley would have described his path is that the choice made him and the side chose him. In London, where Copley stayed for the rest of his life after 1775, the rest of his long life, 40 more years, um, the American Revolution remained his context and his great subject. Um, and I think we can talk about most of his major uh, English paintings, and don't worry, I'm not going to talk about most of his major English paintings, as Revolutionary War paintings, including Watson and Sharp. Um, before, including the death of the Earl of Chatham, uh, the great American champion and uh, enemy of independence. Um, and the one I want to talk about with you briefly tonight um, is my favorite of his large canvases, uh, the death of Major Pearson, which is, uh, which is displayed uh, at the Great Acclaim in 1784. So there are... Um, many ways in which this painting stands for Copley's war and Britain's American war, which was a war nobody chose, right? Britain would have also uh, shared this narrative of a war that they didn't chose, but that chose, chose them. Uh, so this is a battle that happened in January of 1781. Um, you will notice that uh, redcoats are the heroes of the battle, but there are no American villains. This is typical of the way Copley is threading the needle of evoking and representing and seeking glory in this world for a British, in this war for a British art loving public. Uh, there's a rump group of French legionnaires sniveling in the background there. Uh, and when you see it close up, they really are painted like cartoons. Um, it's a battle that took place on, the, on that crucial theater, the Isle of Jersey in the English Channel. Um, it is such an insignificant battle that uh, as soon as it's over, and it lasts all of 15 minutes, um, the French government disavows its own incursion into this little um, island garrison town, and the London newspapers need to tell readers where Jersey is and why it should be considered important that England held it, um, a sure sign that it was not important that England held it. It would have been awful if England had lost it, but not important. Uh, Major Francis Pearson, who's our dead body in the center, is uh, the name of the moment for about 20 minutes, uh, just because he died young in a war that too many young men were dying. Um, so Copley is painting in a place uh, where um, uh, it's Britain's Vietnam, right? Um, and to bring people out to think about martial glory and martial sacrifice, um, you have to recognize that uh, young heroes are being slaughtered as soon as they're made. And that is part of uh, what he's doing, evoking this um, man of feeling dead in the middle of the picture. Um, you can't quite see, and I'll zoom in more closely, on this very striking central figure of African descent, who, um, just to get a sense of what he's doing in the larger action, Pearson has fallen, and he has uh, cited the person who had shot Pearson, <coughs> avenging Pearson's death. Um, it's a very rare portrait of a heroic action by a black figure. Um, uh, in fact, I don't know of other post-medieval figures of black men with guns or knives that are portrayed in heroic terms until Haiti, um, when some of the hottest French revolutionary art um, does portray black men with guns. This is an actual person. Um, I found him in the archives and in a, in a kind of obscure treasure hunt, which I can describe to you later if anybody's curious. Uh, he was one of the many African Americans who fled bondage uh, by joining the British lines in the Carolinas. So he was enslaved in the Carolinas. Uh, he attached himself to somebody uh, in a regiment there um, who wound up in the garrison of Jersey. Uh, he was a free man in this portrait. Uh, he's not a soldier, he's a servant. That's a servant's livery. Um, and he wound up as a hairdresser in London. So putting this figure in the middle of the portrait, um, one of the things that Copley is saying is that the war for liberty 
is a war that Britain is winning, even as it's losing the war for America. Um, and of course, British anti-slavery advances further, faster um, than American anti-slavery does. Um, Copley never joins it in any conservative way because Copley never joins anything. Um, also noticeable in this picture, this little group of civilians fleeing into exile, uh, the cost of war. And that's his wife, Suki, as the model. Uh, his son, John Jr., or Jackie, uh, next to her, and one of the two babies they had in London in her arms. So I want to leave you um, with a little bit of thought about uh, something that Copley himself mused upon when he learned what was going on uh, in America, how short a way we penetrate into the secrets of futurity, what we see and what we don't see. Um, I think one of the things that looking through his eyes, which remember was my gambit at the beginning, asks us to do is to see this very important founding period in America's, in America's history facing forward rather than facing backwards. Um, we see it when it's a fait accompli, um, and we read that back into the story. He faces it forward with no real idea of how it's going to end up. Um, and I think um, that tidiness is always wrong. Our hindsight, which is the only sight we have, is always wrong. Um, but it serves us particularly ill um, when we talk about the era of the American Revolution. So Copley saw into the future well in some ways and poorly in others. He knew the Americans would win. That's prescient. Um, and yet, in many other ways, uh, he poorly apprehended the way that um, the best, most strategic or tactical choice would be made. Uh, to give one example, um, by 1793, the American economy is going like this, and Britain is going back into a war which we know doesn't last for nearly 25 years. Um, so he would have been much better off to see far enough into futurity to say, you know what, I'm going to have another wretched boat crossing. It's not so bad. Um, he misses his moment in various ways. So he paints the American Revolution too long. He's still trying to uh, capture the public eye with pictures of the American Revolution after uh, England has turned its eyes to France. Um, then when he tries to paint the Napoleonic Wars, he misses again there. Um, so this is Admiral Duncan from the Battle of Camperdown. Have you ever heard of the Battle of Camperdown? I haven't done with very few people. All right. Um, the, he has two possibilities for painting a heroic uh, Napoleonic War picture this spring of 1796. The other one he's thinking about and decides not to do is this Nelson guy in the Battle of Camperdown. <laughs> um, how short a way do you see into the secrets of future? Um, another sort of too much, too late picture uh, by Copley is this, one of his last pictures, uh, he tries for the entirety of his English career to get a sitting with the royal. Um, there's a whole long story for what, of what it takes to seek royal patronage successfully. Coming out of Boston, all elbows and corners, the only child whose mother has always told you you're the most fantastic thing in the world, at the age of 38, when your personality is already entirely well formed, makes you a poor courtier. Um, finally, in the 18 aughts, he gets a seating with uh, the uh, um, son of George III, the future George IV, who he paints here uh, as what the reviewers call a robbing mad general and a Lilliputian review. Um, it pictures a failure. Critically, it's such a failure on exhibit that uh, you can't sell an engraving of it, which is the only way you make money out of these huge public canvases. Um, does, it, does anyone see it? It's at the MFA. Um, so if you're looking at Revere here, it's right outside the door to the side. And what it's doing is just coloring the space by the elevator. <laughs> it's literally hiding in the inside. So that's the sad ending. The, um, uh, the pictures get big, but the vision gets small ending, which characterizes the point, the part of his England career after the American Revolution is no longer a viable and exciting subject. Um, the happier ending, uh, and the ending that I think he put at the center of his life, um, is the story of the family. This is the uh, portrait of Copley's family that hangs at the National Gallery. 
I love this chain of hands that goes right down the center of it. He's painting it in the spring of 1776. If you're up close and with a child almost about to go to college, it will make me cry. And even remember when you could sink your hand into a toddler's flesh like that, you can sort of see the yieldingness of the toddler's flesh and her wedding ring right in the center of the picture. Um, so he said in his letters on the grand tour that bringing his children into the great world with reputation was the sort of summum bonum of his goals. And um, I want, as somebody who was trained in women's history, to take that seriously. Uh, you know, why should we ignore his family when he said that it was at the center of his purpose? Of, you know, that was what his greatness in his trade was in the service of, uh, he said. So in this, he succeeds. Uh, so the little boy who is fleeing at the edge of the death of Major Pearson, uh, becomes the Baron Lyndhurst, uh, a peer of the new creation and Lord High Chancellor of England, uh, a Tory lawyer and politician who makes his name defending the Luddites when they break their looms in the 18-teens. Uh, another sort of attached to the pastness quality of Copley's, uh, Copley's family. And the daughter in the middle of the uh, family portrait, uh, Betsy Copley, Marries uh, late as her father did. We must have been very worried about her marriage ability by the time she uh, wed at 30. Uh, a man named Gardner Green of Boston, a Demerara merchant, uh, late of Boston, who returns to Boston and brings her back. Demerara merchant means he's a massive slaver. So a thousand bonds people on Caribbean sugar plantations. So that slaving wealth both catalyzes Copley's portion after his marriage and saves his late life. It's his daughters funneling the husband's money back to England that keeps Copley and his wife's body and soul together in their later years, and it fuels the son's rise through the English bar. Betsy lives a very, very long time. Uh, this is Betsy at 96 in the, uh, in the year 1882, I'm sorry, 1862, during the American Civil War. They call the American Civil War a revolution, just as they call the American Revolution a Civil War. Um, and uh, when she dies, she is remembered as the last loyalist in Boston. Um, her, uh, her great gifts to the United States are two. Uh, she is the keeper of the family letters. And everything that we have uh, in private hands on this side of the, everything we have in public hands on this side of the Atlantic came through her custody and governance of those materials. Um, and she also set in motion the bringing of Copley's pictures to the United States, a country that they had never been, even the ones that were painted in Boston. So it is through her agency she sends granddaughters and, uh, and purchasers to her brother's estate sale, that um, that head of a favorite Negro, that the family picture, boy with the squirrel, the ascension, the core of the MFA's collection comes through Betty. What she would Betsy, what she would have said, bringing the pictures from home, um, but of course she was expatriating the pictures from Britain um, for the first time in their lives. Thank you.
nasty to poor Richard Clark, who had, after all, lost everything. The man who knew Camper now. <laughs> so, um, tell us how you did find out about the former slave and the and what was his oh, name? Oh, I'm too? so glad you asked. <laughs> um, so he is. I have. A, he's one of two people. There is a Burton and an Alec um, uh, without last names. Um, and Burton is the older one. I think he's Burton. The younger one would have been a senior during the time of this painting. Um, so in real life, or IRL, as my kids say. Uh, <laughs> Burton or Alec was not Major Pearson's servant, which is the role he plays in the painting, the servant who avenges his master. He was the servant of another officer in the tableau. And that other officer uh, sued his wife for divorce in London. And that divorce trial was published. And um, in the trial, there's a sort of uh, uh, restoration farce Everybody in the house has to come forward and talk about her adultery. And Burton and Alec are riverine servants in his household. Um, so they talk about you know when the household came back from Jersey to London, uh, the lover came over in his carriage, and the wife said, no, you should wear my lover's livery, not my terrible husband. And he says, I am your husband's man. And um, so that's how I found it. Um, and then I can trace. The, the officer's career back to the Carolinas and forward. He goes on, you know, he's a climber, so he goes on to Jamaica, which is a, a big, important theater. The whole, the whole war is not about keeping Boston, it's about keeping Jamaica. Um, and uh, that would have been a sort of glorious place to be defending. Shark, and there's no shark here. So. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I can't. Really, I, 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 you came from a shark. shark. Yeah, I, I, I love to see sharks eating yeah. people. But, but <laughs> what I really wanted to know was what do you make of a uh, black man in that, in that boat? And I, I mean, I know originally the sketch had a white man at the right. head of the, of, the, of the rescue boat. But, um, you know, as with all things political, you know, some people are saying, oh, this is a monument to African freedom. Others are saying, oh, he's really a, a servant. He's not doing anything. Other people say, oh, he represents this, that, and the other thing. So, you know, I mean, uh, Africans were very common in all seafaring right. uh, throughout the Caribbean. Right. This is in Cuba. So, what do you make of that whole thing? And, what does it mean, if anything? You know, I'm not sure I believe it means anything, but... Um, I was going to go back to the early seascape where um, you can see there, as he's trying to put that seaborne world into color, that there's a huge range of skin tones, which there would never have been in the original painting. So you're absolutely right. A seaport world has a lot of people from a lot of places. Uh, it's Havana Harbor in the late 1740s. Um, uh, the African trade is the center of that trade, right? This is the person who is a commodity, who is at the center of everything Havana is doing, which is uh, sugar-based. Um, we know exactly, as you said, that Copley made a pictorial choice. Um, he had a white figure there, and he swapped in a black one. Um, I think he would have done it certainly for more reasons than just tonal variation. Um, although the tonal variation is exciting. We also know that in reviews at the time when it was showed in 1778, um, the, the attitude of the black figure was a subject of more comment than almost anything else about the, about the picture. He's too passive. He's, if, he's, if you're going to show somebody that passive, you should show a woman. Um, it's, it's striking. So if his goal is to have something that arrests the eye besides the shark, uh, he's made that. I think the, the combination of the Watson figure and the Pearson figure um, creates a sort of British liberty narrative that's figured around black action together. If he had never painted Pearson, I would have said, well, we really can't say what he's, what he's doing here. Um, having painted Pearson only six years later, um, I think there is something about, uh, you know, he's threading the needle. What is the war that 
Britons can still celebrate when they come out and see these, uh, these paintings of an increasingly former lord. Um, one of the things that they can still celebrate is that uh, British liberty, such an important phrase in their world, um, is not a lie. Um, so, I, you know, it's, I wouldn't call it an abolitionist statement. I think he's wrapping himself in a version of the empire in which um, black movement and, uh, and liberty, including liberty to black people, is quite seminal. Uh, you know, doesn't bother him none that his daughter marries a young merchant in, uh, in 1800. Actually, it probably bothered him plenty, but it was, but it was you know, the guy was a three-time widow. He could not have widowed, he could not have been a real catch, but he could get her married. Um, I scoured London anti-slavery organizations to see if he showed up anywhere, and he didn't. Um, but he was not a political actor. I'll say one more thing on this question which may be of greater interest to me than it is to most people. Um, and now I forgot what the one more thing was that I was going to say on yeah. this question. That's terrible. It'll come back to me soon. I've got one totally off the wall question. Black Terry Turbin, I don't know what I've got, but I know what I like. Mm -hmm. Almost every picture that I can think of and every museum I've ever seen, the light comes this way. The light on Paul Revere's face is on his right side coming in from my left. Why is that so? Are more painters one-handed than the other? Do they put their sources of light in one direction than the other? Do you, is it because people read from this way over? I mean, of the portraits of the American presidents, there's what, 44 portraits or 44 presidents, but there's maybe 41 portraits hanging in the White House. All the Kennedys, the light comes from the left. And Kennedys, it comes down from above because he's looking, you know, uh, in contemplation down there. The that. light's supposed to come right out of their foreheads. <laughs> 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 I know, but I mean, that's yeah. just an example. And, and if I go through major paintings, yeah. even if it's still light, uh, except if you get something that is not death, you know, like yeah. Picasso. Is so my, my guess is that. Um, uh, people are totally dependent on natural light. Obviously, there are specialized fixtures in the Royal Academy to give a sort of floodlight effect in right. ours. But, you know, I can tell you, Copley's painting room is on the north side of a house on Cambridge Street. But see the light on his face, the light on his, right. it's all coming this way. So, but, but um, you know, maybe people people chose the strongest, clearest light, which was often either north or east. I just think it was maybe the handedness of the yeah. I, well, one thing I know about Copley for sure is he really could only paint something he was seeing. Okay. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who uh, are fusing the, the empirical world to the mind's eye. If he couldn't see it, he really couldn't. Well, see, as a complete lefty, I see everything back. <laughs> and I spent my whole life wondering why they're not looking that way and why the light isn't coming that way. Just, I remember my, my last point. Yeah. To, uh, to the gentleman before. So uh, both Watson and Pearson are painted at a moment when heroic figures of non-whites are increasingly part of the British art vocabulary. So uh, Joseph Brandt, the loyalist uh, Onondaga general, who's painted by Stuart and by Romney. Oh my, the, um, the Tahitian who is brought back by Captain Cook and is a kind of London celebrity. Um, Francis Barber, who is probably one of uh, Reynolds's servants. Um, Ignatius Sancho, the grocer, become a uh, literary figure. Um, so uh, ennobling figures of black men at work of one kind or another, including intellectual work, are, are a cutting edge of British visual culture. Um, and that, of course, is one of the many things he would not have seen here.